another exciting edition of Cambridge Inside Out. My name is Robert Winters and I'm Susanna Sagat and we have a special guest today. Do you want to introduce him? I, uh, to my left, to your right, um, we have Anthony Galluccio, former city councilor, former state senator and former mayor. Thank you. Happy right. to be here, Robert right. and Susanna. Right. Thanks yeah. for having so me. We are, we are humbled you. in your presence. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, we'll, we have a, a few things to say here. I'm, I wanted to sort of kick off the show this time around. This is the first of two half-hour segments we'll do on the same uh, similar vein. Uh, just to mention a couple of things related to this year's election uh, election, election programming. Uh, one thing, if, I don't know if people heard it or not, but there had been some possibility that the election commission was going to reduce the number of choices on the city council ballot to 18. I got the word a few days ago that nope, it's back up to 25. So what we said earlier, that you can vote for as many city council candidates as you wish, that's back on again. So um, again, vote for as many as you wish. Uh, second thing worth noting, um, I think, is that the there are some city council candidate forums coming up, and there will soon be some school committee candidate forums um, as well. Uh, we'll just mention the ones that are coming up right away. There'll be a lot more in mid-October. Uh, there's a candidates forum sponsored by the East Cambridge planning team that's taking place on Friday, September 27th, which will actually be moderated by former governor Michael and presidential candidate Michael Dukakis. Uh, that's 7.30 p.m. this coming Friday at the Dante Alighieri Society on Hampshire Street. Uh, then again on Wednesday, October 2nd, will be a sort of rather novel format, format um, council candidate forum kind of around many tables that the Mid Cambridge Neighborhood Association um, uh, conducts. This will be held, I'm not quite sure of the time, but it probably be in the 7, 6.30 to 7.30 range at Cambridge College at 1000 Mass Ave. So that'll be on Wednesday, October 2nd. All right. And uh, I think with that, maybe we should carry oh, on. Oh, we forgot to say one thing. Oh, please. Uh, do you know what anniversary this is for CCTV? This is a test for our guests. Mm. Dun, 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 dun. 35. Great. It's 25 years of CCTV. <laughs> and oh, aim high. <laughs> there, and we have a big barbecue coming, and we wish CCTV a happy birthday. And because if when you come to CCTV, you'll see a lot of historic pictures on the wall. And that's why we're especially glad to have Anthony here. He has a lot of history, and we're going to try to pluck as many stories from him as we can. <laughs> as we possibly can. So, uh, in that vein, let's not talk so much about the past. Let's first, let's, what, you, what have you been up to, Anthony? First of all, that, that's, that, that I do remember now, and that was, that was an interesting time in Cambridge because there was such desperation to get cable TV. That's right. And uh, I can remember right. people who had relatives, and it was probably Arlington that would say, how can we not have cable yet? And, you know, Bob Healy, you better get moving and get us cable TV. <laughs> And uh, so right. much has changed. Bob's, you know, retired. Sue, thank goodness, is still here, and we have a great new cable st uh, headquarters here for CCTV. Yeah. So, yeah. progress. Yeah, we're definitely moving along. So, what have you been up to, Anthony? Just about everything. Uh, <laughs> I, having I a lot you. of fun. A lot, yeah. lot of fun. I, I, I think uh, Margaret Drury, who is a, a wonderful city clerk, and is uh, now on the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority right, Board. Right, that's right, a glutton for punishment. Uh, <laughs> she, I think at one point she said, I said, what, you know, what should I do? She said, just go go live, you know, because I, I had been in in politics, you know, since since I came home from college, I got active, and then it was just a whirlwind. So I'm having a lot of fun. I opened a, a local law firm, uh, which is general practice, and we're doing a little of everything and a lot of some things, and I'm... Doing every, I'm on a couple boards. I'm on Central Latinos board. I'm on the Hildebrand Family Self Help That's Center great. board. Both of those I've been on for a long time. Hildebrand for over 10 years, and I'm coaching little league, pop on a football. I'm helping out with the Cambridge High School football team. I have my own charity. So all the stuff that I didn't really have a lot of time to do. You I'm that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm really happy and enjoying being able to do a whole bunch of stuff. Now I've seen you in recent this. Oh, largely over this past year, very actively involved with some of the rezoning processes. I think there was some petitions for North Point, mm -hmm. as well as down the MIT Kendall petition. Yeah, so when I, when I opened the practice, which was probably four years ago, I, you know, I was doing a lot of different kinds of law, criminal law, real estate. My partner does a lot of family law and civil. 
and as things have evolved, I've gotten uh, gotten more involved in uh, land use. So I'm doing some major projects in Somerville, uh, which has been fun. Right. Of course, North Point crosses over into Somerville, so yes, I do the Cambridge. But uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of fun uh, planning and land use issues, which were always interesting locally and i got pretty deep into uh so as a city council you were on one side of the zoning game now you're sort of on the other side of the game. well and i've done, yeah i've actually done and i've done some neighborhood stuff too i i was okay. able so i i you know little little, little of both but uh i'm having a lot yeah. of fun it keeps me out it that keeps me out in the community which is fun i see you all the time out, in, out about. so we're prepping up for our big show on uh, election night and we spend some time every week on city council issues. So we'd like to talk to you a little bit about your life as a city councilor and as a candidate and how things have changed and how things haven't. So do you want to start with yeah, a couple just, of the questions? Just to briefly to say this, is that um, you were first a candidate for city council in 1993, which strange as it may seem, I was too, as was Michael Sullivan and quite a few others. That was a big year. Similar year, actually, to this year, in the sense that there were two vacancies on the city council that year, and it brought out a lot of candidates. There are 25 candidates this year, and there are 29 candidates back then. Right. So there's a, there's a little bit of a parallel and yeah. some very significant differences. So we just sort of thought maybe, just sort of generally speaking, if you have recollections or some, you know, tales of glory yeah. and woe of your early days in the local Cambridge political world. Yeah. Well, you know, I was thinking back to 1993, uh, just, you know, in, in thinking about the show. And you're right, there are some parallels. There were a lot of candidates that year. Um, back then, I was trying to sort of think about what has changed. And I think the big difference is the obviously electronic, uh, the, the age of emails, and, te and new technology. Back back then, it was really about kind of physical energy. Oh, yeah. So, you, you know, we, we I can remember we started in January. Exactly. Did you say volunteers? Yeah. I remember, you know, we, we, we started in January with volunteer meetings, meetings in VFW halls and just getting volunteers ready. And then as soon as spring broke, it was you wanted to show some activity and then you had to get your yard signs up way before Labor Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and then as you know as you progressed into the fall it was like you wanted to build this sense of growth and you were on the move and more volunteers and more yeah. yard signs and now i think it's 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 much more uh email based you know a, as somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about who's identifying voters properly oh, you yeah. know i i wonder back then we'd always say yeah so and so has three yard signs up for three different candidates who they're voting for. <laughs> now I think wasn't that a Russell location? <laughs> right. but now it's so and so's on six different email lists and who are they voting for? Yeah, so exactly. it, it still comes down to figuring out who's really giving those number one votes to who. But I think the the means of communication has evolved, and yes. it's probably a little less exciting because <laughs> right. you don't get to see the growth and the energy, right. which I think was a lot of fun back then. You know, it was a lot of work, but was also unifying because the the acts of the act of getting volunteers together and showing support also unified people and it, and it was exciting right these days there are actually some campaigns I've noticed from the reports are actually paying for canvassers and they they hire camp I think there's one entity called the Cambridge Network and there's some other this sort of like almost like campaigns for hire and my recollection correct me if I'm wrong you know thinking back to the old Sullivan campaigns and some of the great political times it was it wasn't a professional operation. It was like friends and family. And if you needed to pay somebody, okay, great. But the core of it was always friends and family. Yeah. You know? I love that neighbors would get together in some living room, some dining room with the envelopes and the leaflets and fold and stuff <laughs> and have to lick all those envelopes and, and, and seal them and stamp them and drag those huge boxes to the mail. Yeah. That happens very rarely. It's so true. Now you send it off to a service. Although right? I did see a tweet from Tim Toomey's campaign saying we finished our stuffing and there were like six <laughs> big boxes ready well, to go to but, the post office. But, so some people still do it. But you know, the Toomey campaign, when you look at campaign finance reports, he's still not showing like a, camp, a paid campaign manager. So that's very old style. Yeah, but, but so, it gets neighbors together. Correct. It absolutely does. I think and it also, there's a big payoff in terms of long-term sustainability of your campaigns. Because these are your people who are going to stay with you, uh, and 
Right. Dear, dear friend cards were, were, were a great example of that. So there, cause there was the act of deciding who you were going to ask. And then the ask itself was a form of campaigning. So even if somebody didn't do dear friend cards, the fact that, you know, your aunt or your friend called somebody else, you knew at least they had conveyed the message that they were supporting you and, and, and why. So that was a whole segment of the campaign that, that was, was a big piece back then. I think that actually plays into another reality that I think was true then. It's also true today, which is that there are these, there are certain individuals who are, maybe because not, people, not everybody has the time to, or desire to l learn about all the candidates, who when you get toward late October, they'll say, hey, who's good here? Who should I be thinking of? And to have certain individuals on board as part of your yeah. team becomes pretty helpful. Well, I think, and Susanna, you will, you will remember this. It, it, there's a big difference between campaigning as a new candidate where you have to create a theme and sort of reasons for what you will do if you're in office right. versus when you're an incumbent, you really should have already secured supporters. And then the campaign is about finding and trolling for those supporters who presumably are already ready to support you. Right. So it, you know, it's really two different uh, styles and themes, whether you're a new candidate or an incumbent. For me, the difference was when you're new, people were willing to say, okay, I'll vote for you because, you know, you're going to lose anyway. So my vote will go to my <laughs> number two. So I'm not losing anything. Whereas when you're running for re-election, you're begging them, please don't play with your That's votes. Right. I need this vote. Please don't play with it. I know she's cute, one. but she's no good for you. You know, you've got to stay with me. I'm the lo be people loyal say, to People me, are yeah. willing to experiment and, and <laughs> at least they were my, my people. They were willing to give someone else a chance. Yeah. You know, and so it was like, please don't play yeah. with your number one. Well, and, th and that that's the benefit, I still think, of using uh, friends and supporters to make phone calls because, you know, somebody, a paid caller from Oklahoma <laughs> isn't yeah. going to say, Susanna really needs this vote. Right. You know, and so, you know, I, I always encourage people to be fluid on the phones. Don't become uh, don't become that out of state caller. Right. Make it personal. Yes. Say why, why you're helping the, the candidate say because I didn't I called them for help and they responded to me and that's why I'm volunteering because it's really refreshing but I, I think sometimes home crafted campaigns try to become that professional campaign and I, I think that's a mistake I think it's refreshing to have yeah. the yeah, I think it's a lot more effective when they just have that real that sense of reality you know these are people you either grew up with or you could bump into on the street. Yeah, and are, and are excited day. about, right? Absolutely yeah. right. I remember one election night, it was rainy, it was horrible, and my, my daughter at the time was really little, but she was really passionate about getting me elected, and she was out there with a sign saying, please vote for my mom. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, you know, that, that helps. I, I, can, I can remember being, I, I shouldn't tell the story, but, you know, when you subject yourself to a street corner, I mean... We it's don't brutal. tell, we don't, oh my God. And people <laughs> wonder why we're so patient, right? And it's like, you know, I can remember standing at, at Concord and Huron oh, and yeah. somebody coming by and saying, oh, uh, you know, I think I was still a law student. I mean, it was an early campaign yeah. or I was just out of law school and someone said, yo, you're going to get all these people jobs. And I was so confused by the comment. And I said, I said, hold on. This is my mother. That's my sister. This is my best friend. And I went off to say all the jobs they had, and they were all gainfully employed. Yeah. But, you know, it was like, you know, there is a reason why some candidates tend to stay out of the, 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 the public realm, because it can be tough out there. Yeah. It's not always fun. I mean, you go home sometimes with your head spinning, and, uh, but it's a good experience. Well, actually, one of the comments we made last week was so. Uh, Many times a new candidate will come in there with a head full of brilliant ideas, how I'm going to save the world, do this and that. They knock on the first door and the person sort of says, well, I'm really angry about that, <laughs> that bump in the street or that nasty neighbor over the back fence. And the reality when you're actually doing it is a lot different than the theory you came in with. Do the door knocking is one of the most challenging, um, understated things because, you know, it's always go knock some doors, go knock some it's doors. It's really hard. <laughs> how to do it, how to keep moving, how to do it so that you don't get bogged down, and also enjoying it, yeah. you know, which is a whole nother element of this, which I think you guys realize. The key, the key thing to me about a campaign is you have to just seed yourself to it, and you just have to, it's like playing football in the rain like we did this morning. Get wet, 
Accept it. Have fun. <laughs> your, your life, as you know, it is now over. You will be soaked. And a campaign is the same way. It's just it, your, your life, as you know, you it's know, over. And if you fight it, good luck. <laughs> I'll actually say something else that I remember from being candidate back when you were first a candidate, too, is that, you know, first you start to think, oh, this is competitive. And there's no question that it is competitive. However, you're all going to the same events, you know, you're showing up at, you know, uh, Sullivan Time. It's so true, yeah. You know, and with, hosted with Edward Sullivan and those, I remember yeah. some of those early ones. Uh, and you're, you go from forum to forum to forum, and they're asking you many times the same questions. And it, I always likened it to being kind of like on the tennis tour. Yeah. So you're, you're out there, you know, beating heads out on the court, but ultimately you actually develop friendships. So, Absolutely. And honestly, people like yourself and, and Michael Sullivan and I, you know, we've remained pretty good friends oh, as yeah. a result. It was all born out of a political campaign. I can remember seeing, you know, Jimmy McGrail jogging Fresh Pond. It, it was probably spring going into the election. And, you know, I was trying to lose some weight. He was trying to lose some weight. <laughs> and it was like, oh, my gosh. We're, we, we had the same mindset. And then it was, you know, Jim McSweeney was in, in the... And I, well, we, yeah. we really, you know... You really do, you really do, and I think even now when you see former elected officials, I don't really remember the disagreements over issues. Yeah. I remember the late night meetings and getting through tough issues together and the long yeah. campaigns, and I think there is a bond there because it's, it's, so, much, it's so much more work and it's, 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 it's really an enduring exercise, a campaign. And I hope all the new candidates especially really appreciate the fact that when, you know, they will elect the 30, what is it, 30, 25 can, uh, candidates, nine to be elected. So that leaves 16, did I do the math right, <laughs> Anthony? <laughs> you stick with the math. <laughs> right. But it means there'll be a lot more people who will not be elected and there is life after that. And, you know, I, I dare say that many of the, candidates, the new candidates this year will end up becoming fast friends with the people with whom they might somewhat... Well, you spend so much time together. They, you spend, it's like dating. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you talked about the forums. Those are really tough because unless they're but, televised, but they, right. you, know, you, get, you know, you get there. I can remember a, a, a debate with, uh, when I ran for state rep with Alice Wolf, who was... You know, Alice and I have become really good friends over the years, and I learned a lot from her. And I can remember getting all geared up for this debate. It was over in Walden Square, and it went, you know, I thought it went pretty well, and I said to my mother, you know, what do you think? And she said, you did pretty good, but the only people who were there were the people that were already going to vote for That's Alice. Right. And the, so go get out and start campaigning That's again because right. it really doesn't matter. And I said, oh my God, she's right again. Yeah. You're actually, that's absolutely <laughs> true. And I, it's one of the sad realities. You go to these candidate forums. I'm really, please, everybody, go to the candidate yeah. forum. And yes. somebody film it and put it on YouTube yeah. so that... Or yeah. CCTV. It, it, yeah, that's CCTV. right. <laughs> that's right. Right, because it's oftentimes the people who are in the audience are the ones who came with the yeah. candidates. And now, that's unfortunate. I, I do have to say the campaigns have... Uh, and I'm, I'm not, bl this is no judgment towards the current candidates because the, the, everybody's, the rules are the rules when you start. But yeah. back then, I mean, we would announce in the paper around January, February, we were running. And, yes. and then in the springtime, it was well known. Yep. And I think it, it's become a shorter tight, yeah. cycle, which, you know, I think it's given that there isn't an incredible amount of attention shown towards local elections versus right. you know a governor's race or a congressional i think two months is a really short time uh to get your name out there and to and to campaign heavily especially since it gets darker really quick you know right around now it it, it starts yeah. to really get dark and it's tough to knock doors well i think a lot of the early parts of the campaign for many of the new candidates especially are just sort of building up a base of some core support and some money. You take some money. Oh, they cost so much more. They have yeah. to raise so much you money gotta, in such a short time. Yeah, right now, I think, as a, without naming names, right now, the, the top candidate um, has already raised about $40,000. That's actually one of the new candidates. But I think before all is said and done, you know, you, a lot of times you don't even see any accounting of the expenses till the election's all over. You know, so you'll have candidates who'll be way over that. If you look at it, um, and I think a lot of candidates get so caught up in the sort of inside of baseball oh, yeah. issues, which is unfortunate. I understand why it happens, but the average resident is, you know, trying to get their kid to school. Maybe there's a hot issue in the neighborhood, or, or maybe it's just sort of day-to-day, -day, you know, schools, public safety, you know. And, and I think, you know, the candidates forget that there's this really quick window where people will sum you up. 
And I think as an example, the year that Marjorie uh, didn't get the signatures right. and, and, she was, and she had to run as a sticker campaign, I thought, she's going to do great because just the act of, oh, Marjorie didn't get the signatures was forced, yeah, we're true. forcing people to talk about Marjorie yeah. Decker. She and became she, front and center, absolutely and right. She, you know, so. And that was not done intentionally, but there were quite a few other candidates, especially incumbents, who said, she did that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> not that, right, and I know she would say, trust no me, trust me, it purpose. didn't happen. Yeah. But, yeah. but no, I think that's the... But so. it makes you not play with those ones either. It that's makes, right. Her her people knew they had to vote for her number one because otherwise right. she would have been gone. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And and the mailing is a really interesting piece of this because if you you know right now there's a congressional race going on right so in oh, parts yeah. of Cambridge but it's a little confusing. It's what October fifteenth uh, primary. And then November fifth municipal election, and then a and December tenth final final for the um, marquee seat, right? But so you could spend, you know, anywhere from you know seventy five hundred to fifteen thousand on a serious mailing, yeah, and or anywhere in between, and it lands the same day as three congressional candidates yeah. are in your mailbox, <laughs> and yeah, so that's a whole science where you know you can get lost in as well, and it's expensive. Well, there might actually be this little window where after the primary is, is done when there'll be a sudden drop off. And then that's really, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine if you're a city council uh, candidate or a school committee candidate, you really want to sort of take full advantage of that little window in there yeah. between mid-October and, well, you're going to do that anyway, I suppose. Yeah, and simple themes. You, you, Susanna made a great point about house parties. I mean, because those things can just go on. Um, irrespective of all the, these other things going on, if, if somebody can get 20 or 25 people into somebody's living room, oh, that's huge. and they can become <laughs> ambassadors of the message. It's a yeah. multiplier effect. Yeah, I think the year that, the year that Kathy and Catherine were, that, were that, elected, that was it was 93. House Party Central. I yeah, mean, it, yeah. it, there was just this wave of activity because of the, reti you know, the retirements. And... People were knew they you know people knew they had to kind of get introduced and introduce new candidates. Yeah, I'm not sure there's that appetite this year um, for for the that people. I don't see the, the the sort of energy around that that these two really I mean iconic figures in in local politics. I mean Henrietta has been around for so long. Uh, Marjorie, you know, having run in state races, and I mean. These are big name local, both women. You know, there's a, there's a, there should be a little more energy around that. We'll see if it picks up, you know, October 1st and in that, in that next month. But that, that, that's, for in our world, that's a big development. That's it's huge. It's a big change. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Especially if the women are replaced by men. That makes it, it'll make a big difference. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating piece of it. And, and Henrietta... Being a former mayor, started out on the school committee. Marjorie mm -hmm. certainly as somebody who didn't serve on the school committee, but kept her hand in youth issues yep. and and kept Our an eye on school issues, issues, and you know, went to Ringin Latin and and so the, you know to me that this similar there, but you're absolutely right. How does how does the demographic piece of that affect the campaign? And I think a lot of that has to do with whether new candidates. Again, if, if you get lost in sort of whatever the hot issues you think they are versus the reality of who's leaving, where are the votes, go get them. This, and and you know. let's not forget, these are PR elections. It's not just a plurality election where you're just sort of like going head to head against two popular people. You, some of it is sort of micro targeted, you know, it's like, you know, because uh, of the way you do with the rank choice balloting is that you might have candidates of one particular description or focusing on issues there. Not essentially, they're not even running against the candidates from a different demographic. Right. So you really have to micro-target the way you you do this. And so, if you have two people, two candidates who are leaving, you know, how do you take yeah. advantage of those freed votes? Because it's much easier to get a free vote than to steal yeah. away an existing number one. It's it's not it's not a great game for nice just nice people if you think you're going to win the first time because Susanna you, you, yeah. you probably remember nice this person. no but you don't win <laughs> you don't win because what happens is you know and I was I was absolutely culpable of this I you know you go to these events and you say oh my god I met 25 of the nicest people and I went to the old time baseball yeah. game and then you go 
Yeah, but they're voting for Sullivan yeah. and they're voting for <laughs> who you win. So, you know, you can, especially your first campaign, you could really lose and say, wow, that was awesome. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure yeah. that's a bad thing. Well, you're, it's, you're, well, it depends on what your strategy is, right? Yeah. I mean, did you have that strategy saying, okay, here's how many people I think are going to vote. I need this percentage votes to win. So who are these specific number of people that I'm going to get? And these are the, I need this many number ones. No, and it was well, the most fun. How did you do it? We, we, we lost and oh. we didn't. We had the most, I was the most fun I probably have. So had. when you won, did you, were you scientific? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's when we, be, that's when we knew. But then I had been a city councilor and then my attitude was, I better have so many votes. I think I have this many supporters out there, right. and we got to go find them. Hold them and but build them. The yeah. first time, it's really more about community yeah. organizing, which you know about, you know, in yeah. your union days. It was fun, and it was more about sort of it was more of a cheerleading yeah. sort of rally, and and you didn't really know what was going to happen. I I think we got Tip O'Neill wrote um, when we went when I went to see Tip at a book signing. I came home, I looked at the thing and he said, you got more votes than I did the first time I ran for city council. And I said, but, but I lost and he lost too. I think I got like, <laughs> almost, I might've got 800 and I think Tip got like 750 when he ran for city yeah, council. Yeah. And back then it was, you had to crack a thousand. That's right. There yeah. were like some really big names who got a thousand and never got elected to the city council. Yeah, and I, yeah. thought I, I thought I was gonna be one of those names. <laughs> yeah, it is typical that you, um, uh, candidates who run the first time don't win, but they it's more likely that you win on, run on the second time. So, but Well, you we know, should... in the next segment, we'll talk more about maybe when Anthony was a, an actual uh, politician, not just a candidate, and maybe talk about some school committee issues too. We'll do that. Okay, this was Cambridge Inside and... Out.